Hello, hello everyone. In this video, we are going to talk about descriptive statistics and how it is important to get it right before plotting and analyzing our data. We use so often words like mean or standard deviation that we tend to forget what they actually mean. So we are going to talk about the median, the mean, the sum of squared errors, the variance, the standard deviation, the standard error of the mean and the confidence interval. Lots of cool stuff. Let's start with the median. Super easy to calculate. We get a bunch of values. We sort them, count them, and the one in the middle is the median. Easy. It is a nice and robust way to summarize one's data, and it is often the reference for central tendency in non-parametric statistics. And then there is the mean, also called the average when arithmetic. Super easy to calculate. We take a bunch of numbers and we divide the sum of them by the sample size. Now, the thing we tend to forget about the mean is that it is a model. A very simple one, but a model nevertheless, because it summarizes the data. And like all models, we want to know if it is a good one, if it has a good fit. It is true for more complex models, like linear models, as it is true for the mean. It is the reason why we are told that we should never present a mean by itself, but always with a measure of error. So, how do we know that the mean is an accurate model? Well, exactly as we would with any model, we look at the difference between the real data and the model created. Which takes us to measures of dispersion. Okay, the easiest way to calculate the dispersion of our data around the mean is to calculate the magnitude of the differences between each data point and the mean. And then we add the differences up and the bigger the sum, the worse the mean is at summarizing the data. However, if we do that, we get zero because the differences being positive and negative cancel each other out. So that's not very useful, huh? To solve that problem, we square the differences and we get the sum of squared errors, which is exactly what it looks like. So here we have the differences, which are called errors. They are the one made by our model, here the mean, in predicting the individual values. So for instance here, the biggest error in absolute value is 1.6. It corresponds to the value the furthest from the mean, so the most poorly predicted by the model. So these errors, we square them, we add them all up, and we get the sum of squared errors. There you go. Now, the sum of squares is a good measure of the accuracy of the model, but it is dependent upon the amount of data. The more data, the higher the sum of squares. So that's not very useful when we are looking at samples with different sizes, for instance. One way to fix that problem is to divide the sum of squares by the number of observations. Well, close enough. As we are interested in measuring the error in the sample to estimate the one in the population, we actually divide the sum of squares by n minus 1 instead of n and we get the variance. Now, let's take a minute to think about that n minus 1 business. It is referred to as the number of degrees of freedom, and it is about going from one population to a sample. So, when we take a sample, the assumption is that the mean of that sample will be similar to the one of the population. For instance, here we have an average of 2.6. So, for example, if we randomly pick 1, 2, 3 and 3, the fifth value has to be 4 to get a mean of 2.6. The idea is that if we have, say, a sample of 5, like here, of which we know the mean, the first value can take whatever value, the second, the third, and the fourth as well, but there is only one possibility for the fifth, if we want to get that sample mean. It is said that when we calculate the variance, we hold that last value constant, so four values out of five can vary freely, hence there is n minus one degrees of freedom. So, you see, once more, the expression says what it is. Now, back to the variance, which is 1.3 here, for instance. It is a good measure of dispersion, but the problem is it is expressed in squared units, which is not super handy, since usually the mean is not. Easy solution to that, we take the square root of the variance, and if we do that, we get the standard deviation. And once again, that expression contains its meaning. It is the deviation of the values from the mean, deviation that we have standardized so that it can be compared across samples of different sizes. How cool is that? So, the standard deviation is a measure of how well the mean represents the data. Now, 
On the left and on the right, we have samples with same mean and same size. On the left, intuitively, we can see that the mean is a good and faithful representation of the data, as they are all nicely tight and close to it. It is a good fit of the data. But on the right, we can see that the data are much more spread and further from the mean, which is not such a good accurate representation. Now, let's talk about the difference between standard deviation and standard error of the mean. People like standard error of the mean better because it looks prettier on graphs as it corresponds to smaller error bars. But the truth is, we cannot think about them that way because they actually tell very different stories. So let's go back to the standard deviation for one minute. It tells us about our sample and our sample only, and it quantifies how much the values vary from one another. It is about the scatter, the spread of the data, and it will not change as in decrease predictably as we acquire more data. Now the standard error of the mean. First, the error bars are smaller because it is the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So, of course, because we divide the standard deviation by something, it produces a smaller value. But most importantly, it tells us a very different story about our data. The standard error of the mean quantifies how accurately we know the true mean of the population. And why can it do that? Because it takes into account the standard deviation, the viability of the data, and the sample size on which, like always, we build our confidence in what our data are telling us. So, unlike the standard deviation, the standard error of the mean does get smaller as our sample gets larger. And why does it do that? Because the mean of a large sample is likely to be closer to the true mean than the mean of a small sample, or because we can trust much more what a big fat sample will tell us than what a skinny one will. To get a better grasp on that idea, let's consider a given population. Now, let's imagine that we take an infinite number of samples from that population. We take small samples and big samples. And finally, let's plot the means of these samples. If we collect small samples at random, it could be that we take values well dispersed and we get, say, that mean. Or we can get unlucky and get three values at the top end of the population and we get this one, or at the bottom end and we will get this one. Because the samples are small, it is quite possible that this could happen. And as a result, the means of these small samples are all over the place. But if we collect big samples, it is quite unlikely that we will pick, say, the 30 values at the top or at the bottom. As a result, the means of these samples will be way closer to one another and on average closer to the real mean. That is the story that the standard error of the mean is telling us, how close the mean of the sample is likely to be from the true one, as in the one of the entire population. And it is why we should trust more the mean of a big fat sample than the one of a skinny one. So, which one to go for? Well, it depends really. It depends on what we want to say. If we want to report on the biological viability of the data, then the standard deviation is the one to go for. Better even, let's show all the data points on the graph. But if we want to report how well we think we are determining the mean, then the standard error of the mean is the one we should choose. But the thing we should never do is go for the standard error of the mean because it looks better on the graph. Remember, the two are telling us very different things about our data. And finally, we have the confidence interval, which I like very much because it is so informative. So once again, let's consider what the expression tells us. It is an interval, so we are talking about two limits, and it is about confidence. More specifically, it is a range of values that we can usually be 95% confident contains the true mean of the population. And why is that? Well, because that's how the formula looks like. We built the confidence interval by adding or subtracting on either side of the mean 1.96 times the standard error of the mean. So we have the standard error, meaning that we have the viability of the data from the standard deviation and also the sample size. It follows that the bigger the sample, the narrower the confidence interval, which makes complete sense as the bigger the sample, the better we are at estimating the true population mean. Now, why 1.96? Well, 
It is because the stuff I have been talking about so far really applies mostly to normally distributed data. And there is nothing ominous about data distribution. On the contrary, it is quite cool to know how our data are distributed, because if we do, we can predict their behavior, like for instance, the proportion of values we expect to see from the mean. And a distribution is not something made, it is something observed. So. If 95% of the values in a sample or within plus or minus 1.96 times the standard error from the mean, then we can say that the data are following a normal distribution. One day, super clever people realized that quite a few values they were looking at, like ways of lobsters or body length of coyotes, behaved in a particular way, and they decided to quantify that, to identify the parameters defining such distribution. And that's where 1.96 comes from. So to recapitulate, the standard deviation is said to be descriptive because it is about our sample and our sample only. Whereas the standard error and the confidence interval are said to be inferential because by taking into account the sample size, they tell us how much we can infer from our sample to the general population or if we can identify differences between populations. Finally, as always, it is really easy to produce descriptive statistics with PRISM. All we have to do is pick descriptive analysis in the analyze menu, choose the descriptives we want and voila! Thank you for listening and don't forget, stats don't have to be scary. <laughs>